All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arielle Summer. I am an internal medicine primary care physician at the Iris Cantor UCLA Health Center. I hope to have a very lively discussion today. I know you guys all had a lot of really excellent questions, both in the small group and in this large group for our practitioners. Um, and I'm going to open up the conversation towards the second half of the hour for audience questions. So please use your note cards as well. So caring for the LGBTQ community means understanding their unique needs and risks, including sensitivity to the increased burdens of substance use and also, and also mental health. Today we will hear from our expert panel on how to deliver patient-centered, culturally informed, and evidence-driven care to our LGBTQ community. So with that, I would like our panelists to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Geis. I am an OBGYN physician with Kaiser Permanente working out of the Panorama City Medical Center. My official clinic is in the North Hollywood area, um, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Hi. My name is Angie Magana. I'm a nurse practitioner and a certified nurse midwife. I uh, provide primary care at the Los Angeles LGBT Center where I am the manager of our Audrey Lord Health Program for lesbian, bisexual, and queer women. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I proudly identify myself as lesbian. I, uh, my name is April Soto, and I am a family physician. I um, practice uh, family, uh, family medicine and also HIV medicine. And um, I also, my passion is LGBTQIA health. It's uh, something that's uh, very important in the world. And uh, I am A as ally, and um, I'm just really honored and privileged to be up here and in, with all of you. And thank you so much. I work out of Kaiser. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marky Knox. I kind of wear two hats up here. I'm the co-chair of the board of directors for the Los Angeles LGBT Center. And I'm an OBGYN in private practice in Santa Monica with probably half of my practice um, straight white girls from Santa Monica, and the other half is uh, LGBTQ, gender fluid, everybody. And they all get along really well, which is really <laughs> amazing. So it's a pleasure to be here today. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'd like to start today by addressing disclosure of LGBTQ status, which can be a significant obstacle for some patients. Dr. Soto and Dr. Knox, can you talk about the barriers to disclosure and what the implications of non-disclosure are? Also, how have you and your offices addressed this? Okay, I'm happy to start on this. Um, first, clearly I think the barriers to disclosure are obvious. They are fear of judgment, they are fear of discrimination, on some level fear of rejection. And when you dig into that, I think the real fear is inappropriate treatment. And that's things like, how big a speculum are you going to use on me? Things like that that really matter to your personal space at that moment in time. And the implications of non-disclosure um, go all the way back to the barriers. If the environment does not allow one to disclose comfortably, then we will never take down the barriers to disclosure anywhere. So we've worked really hard in our practice to overcome that. And it's it's almost been an organic experience. I, I joined Women's Medical Group 35 years ago in 1983. There were three other physicians there, all um, gay, one uh, gay man and two other lesbian physicians and a lesbian nurse practitioner. So we were out, which wasn't always well accepted in the Santa Monica community, although now it certainly is. But that meant that there was, on your first blush, no barrier to disclosure because we were out. So we had a lot of patients who were very comfortable to come into that space. None of our employees were LGBT, but the same employees that were with me then are with me now. And that speaks volumes. I have two women there who've been in the practice longer than I have. And what that says to me is that they're proud of the work that they're doing they are part of the solution, not part of the problem. I don't think we've ever had to lecture them on anything except misgendering people. 
And that's been certainly a, a more common problem in the last 10 years than it was before. Um, one of the things I would say is that we've tried very hard to be a practice that I, I'm not a believer in separate is equal. So we've tried to be a practice that is inclusive of everyone. Everybody in the waiting room should be comfortable with one another and get along. And miraculously, somehow, over time, that's happened. People look up, they see the transgendered women and men in the waiting room, and no one seems to have an issue with that. And if they do, clearly they walk out the door and they don't come back, which is perfectly fine. Um, we try to set the tone from the moment people enter, not only in the atmosphere of the staff in the room, but in the kinds of questions we ask on our history form. All we ask for are the facts. Why are you here? Have you had any babies? How old are you? What's your birthday? What medicines do you take? Are you allergic to anything? The rest of the conversation and getting to know a patient for all of us is when they leave the waiting room with us along, go into an office privately, dressed, and we have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. There is no desk in between. We're sitting in chairs in a room. We're two people having a talk. And inevitably, at the end of that, and we don't ask the questions about disclosure, but inevitably people will volunteer because they're comfortable. They feel like they're being included. And part of that is that we've learned to share some of our own experience with people. When you have somebody in the room who's clearly uncomfortable telling you a tough story, you listen, and then you share what you can that will make them know that they're not alone. They're not the only one in the world like that. And that part of it has been proven to be, I think, the most important part to keeping our practice the way that it is, is that everybody feels like they have you know, a safe place to share and that they're going to be accepted. And that has, in fact, turned out to be the truth. I learned a long time ago, um, actually when I was a resident, one of my attendings, who was a, a very straight man, said to me, every patient you meet will tell you what's wrong and they will tell you what they need. Your job is to listen because they don't know the same language that you do. They don't speak medical ease. But if you listen, you'll know what it is they need. And I found that to be so true over time and to make such a difference in the way that patients feel comfortable and how they enter. So I'm going to shut up and give Dr. Soto a chance. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I thought a lot about this question and what are the barriers to disclosure. <clears throat> and I think there's some two main categories. And one is we live in a binary world. Is it this color or that color? Is it black or white? Is it male, female? Is it a certain religion? We live in a world where we have to categorize things. And what that brings to us is also assumptions. And it's a heteronormative world, and we make assumptions about everybody around us and ourselves. And what that happens to create, I think, is mismanaged expectations. And when we do this, uh, we're not only in injuring the person in front of us, but I think we injure ourselves. And a few examples of this is, um, I have a couple of examples, a 74-year-old um, individual who happened to identify as female, but everywhere she went, she told that she lived with her sister-in-law, both of the husbands had died, and she had some negative interactions with many providers before me, and I've made mistakes too. She'll have interactions with me too that are challenging. Um, and part of those interactions were because she looked the way she did. It was assumed that she had particular identifying factors. And the other thing that I think can challenge us is when we have expectations, it's not only we're expecting that which is going to happen, we've, we're expecting from what has happened to us, it's going to continue to happen. So sometimes we can create our own life in that we expect this provider to be negative to us. And so we can come in with a level of anger as well. And so I've had to look at that with myself in that if I expect somebody who I appear to, who I think appears to be angry, are they going to treat me in a certain way? How much of that situation am I creating? 
And so I've really wanted to look at that in mismanaged expectations. And so that can cause difficult interactions with people. Um, another example is a 60-year-old um, identifies as female uh, person. She told me two days ago that part of the reason why she struggles in some ways is because she has children, everybody assumes that she's straight. And she identifies as bisexual. And that can be challenging. Uh, another example, a 25-year-old comes in just for uh, this person, identifies as cisgendered uh, female, came in to see me for a regular physical, and I started asking the questions. And what was beautiful is this amazing story came out of it. And she happened to be a dominatrix, and she happened to engage in a lot of blood play. And the last interaction she had, she came in for post-exposure prophylaxis or at least education. And what she was reached with was, ah. and I am grateful and lucky that this person would go through bios. And what this person said to me is, if you're nice to trans, you'll be nice to me. And so as a result, now we have this individual on prep. She happens to have, she be, she's polyamorous, but I have her on prep because of her work, because she happens to engage in sounding, cutting, uh, all kinds of stuff, blood play with her dominatrix wor world. And if I had made assumptions about the way that she looked and who she appeared to be, I would have missed so much of the world. And so what have I done in order to help with disclosing? Asking questions with specific language. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I'm the first to acknowledge that I make a lot of mistakes, but it's what I do with those mistakes and I acknowledge it. And when Patients tell me, hey, I didn't really like how you said that. And you're like, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention and let me work on it. And so I look at my part and I look at their part. And if somebody's honest enough to talk to me about something I could have done better, I'm going to listen. Uh, I use a lot of affect labeling and I use a lot of reflective listening uh, because sometimes people can come in with anger that has nothing to do with me. However, it is my privilege and honor that I can sit there and talk to them. And yeah, is it painful? Yes, sometimes, but sometimes we can come out again. Uh, towards a goal of providing the best care for somebody. Uh, I work a lot of educating staff, residents, colleagues on certain terminology. I've learned that in the language of Tagalog, there's not really a uh, he or she. And so sometimes the staff can misgender somebody without even intending to or knowing. And so I'm working with that. Um, and the most important thing, I think, in order to affect change is recognize when I need to change. Thank you so much. For the non-clinician practitioners out there, PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis, so it's HIV preventative medication. So uh, you led very nicely into my next question, actually, for Dr. Geis. Um, you practice as an OBGYN in Panorama City and so uh, North Hollywood, um, and in Panorama City, uh, according to a 2008 Los Angeles Times survey, the majority of, or the highest ethnicity was actually Mexican and Filipino heritage. Um, so can you talk about the intersection between culture and sexuality, and then can you also discuss what you and your staff do to meet the cultural needs of your patient? Perhaps I'll tackle the, the second part of that first. So um, probably one of the biggest cultural barriers we see I would say is actually a language barrier. And it's funny that you brought up the Tagalog aspect of lack of pronouns, he, she, in that that is actually one of the examples I was going to use. But language, I think, has a lot of barriers just beyond the actual language spoken. There are, there are understandings within a language. There's comfort in use of a language. So while many patients may speak English, they feel much more comfortable speaking their native language. And the more comfortable they are, the more easily the, uh, the conversation is going to flow and the more easily people are going to be willing to, uh, you know, to open up and, and speak truthfully. So we make a very strong effort in providing the preferred language of the patient. We're lucky to have a lot of both Spanish-speaking and Tagalog-speaking staff. And so there's often you know, great opportunity for a direct one-on-one -on -one, um, interpreter. Uh, likewise, we make use of telephone and video interpretation as well. And sometimes patients do actually feel more comfortable with a telephone interpreter where it's one less person staring at them and almost becomes like using an app on their phone. 
This is just a voice. It's like Siri. Hey, Siri. Um, and so there are a lot of different angles we can take to kind of overcoming that obstacle and to really getting the patient as comfortable as she can be in communicating with us. And the second part of that obviously goes with listening. And there's, you know, we, we have to take time for listening. And that's probably, I think, one of the obstacles as providers we see. Oh, sorry, because I said that. <laughs> sorry. It's a male sorry voice, so I probably you. didn't notice. Um, sorry, it started like showing all sorts of options for what I was saying. Um, now I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. It was my fault. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. What did I say? Um, but listening, I think, is one of the obstacles we as practitioners experience so frequently because of the time crunch that occurs with a clinic, with how many patients are scheduled in a day, how much time we're given. And so really, it's got to be a concerted effort, both from the staff in the clinic, as well as us as practitioners, to take time outside of those bounds and say, look, I'm going to hear you. Let's talk about what's going on. I think a really important part was what Dr. Knox said about sharing personal things as well. I'm more than happy to bring in, and probably do so way too often, uh, bring in things from my own life. But I do think that's a critical part in sharing that comfort and overcoming those obstacles. Um, I know, you know, with, with culture, it's really hard in the sense that even within a culture, there are so many subcultures. So we talk about a huge portion of the Panorama City population is of Mexican-based, but even within the different regions of Mexico, there are so many different cultural aspects to gender identity, what is a feminine responsibility, so many factors that it really comes down more than anything to just dealing with that person as an individual and how do you see yourself? How do you interpret your culture? Who are you? And how can we best serve you? And I think those are the most critical aspects to that. I think, you know, I'm grateful for the clinic that I work in and that I think the staff has been incredible with it. Um, and I really do think there's a, a great feeling of warmth that just kind of opens up with, you know, even more specific reference to lesbian, bisexual um, health care in every one of our, our um, nursing areas, as well as in every one of our, our clinic rooms, our exam rooms. We have a, a flyer on the wall, I guess you could say, or a small poster, and it's, an, it's a rainbow flag. And says something, and you've probably all heard Kaiser, you know, their theme is thrive. Everybody needs to thrive. But so it's a rainbow flag, and it simply states, Kaiser believes everyone has the right to thrive. And I think that opens it up a lot to kind of that culture as people get into the exam room, and they're sitting there, and they're nervous, and they see this sign, and they realize, I am welcome. Sorry, it gets me a little emotional, because of an experience I had myself. Um, sorry, I didn't know I'd do this. My first experience, and probably what opened me up to more of this kind of being open to my patients, um, my first experience with a physician in the Los Angeles area, um, one of the questions that came up was, do you have sex with men or women? And when I said men, <laughs> the response was, oh, well, we won't put that in your chart, and moved on. And it was one of those shocking moments that I thought, we can do better and we need to do better. And I think that's helped sculpt my attitude toward that whole culture. I apologize for the emotionality. Um, but so I think that's an important part of all of it. I hope that answers. <laughs> Thank you so much. That, honestly, that actually meant a lot to me as a provider to hear that. Oh, I personally appreciate it. I'm sure everybody in the audience appreciates it as well. Thank you. Um, so kind of leading a little bit into that as well, as I had sort of mentioned before, compared to heterosexual patients, several studies have reported a higher prevalence of depression as well as uh, tobacco use, alcohol use, and drug use among the LGBTQ uh, communities and populations. So Ms. Magania, um, can you talk about how the Audrey Lord Health Program integrates behavioral health with traditional health care services? to meet really the specific needs of your patient population? For sure. Um, we've really strived with the Audrey Lord Health Program to create um, integrated behavioral health. We've actually fought to have a behavioral health um, person co-located just a couple doors down from um, where the physical health 
is happening so that it's truly, truly integrated. We created an intake form that not only asks people their like their medical history, but also does a PQH, PHQ <laughs> nine, ask about their substance use, et cetera, so that on their first visit, we're able to look and assess and see what's going on with that. And then we can make appropriate referrals, um, which has been really, really helpful. Um, uh, I was kind of thinking about a story where uh, just recently I saw a patient who bypassed the getting the form because she had already been seen in um, the other part of the clinic a couple times for a vaginitis. Something was going on, she was sure, um, uh, in her genital area. So she came in and I, I took, you know, some history and um, I did the exam and I assured her everything looked healthy, everything looked very normal, but I could tell something was going on. I wasn't sure exactly what, and we're in the middle of a busy day. We get like 10 minutes to see our patients. We're, we're churning through people. So I was able to take her, um, walk her over to see my colleague Amy and say, I said, Amy, um, I introduced them. So it was like a really nice warm handoff. Amy, could you talk, could you talk to her? Um, and uh, uh, just let her know about all the services that we have here. So it was never like a label. It wasn't say, saying, you know, I think you need therapy. I think you need mental health. It was like, oh, you know what? We don't have a lot of time right now. And I know that um, you're new to the center and I want you to get to know about all of the other services that we do provide. So Amy was able to um, sit with her, take time with her, and it turned out she had been sexually assaulted. And so that's what this was about. This is why she was returning to the clinic time and time again. And nobody had really asked her about this. Um, so at the, at the end, she was able to be connected to um, our, we have group therapy, we have individual therapy. I think she started that day in crisis counseling. So we all know, I think most of us know that there's a mind-body connection, right? So what's going on in your body is affecting your mind. What's going on in your mind is affecting your body. So we can't separate those two things. And in our community, we know that we're faced every day with discrimination, every day with stigma, every day of, do I disclose today or do I not disclose today? I was on a phone, phone interview earlier this morning and I didn't realize it, but somebody ha somebody asked me a question about my spouse and I didn't use her pronoun. And my wife called me out on it. She was like, why, did, why were you afraid to disclose? And I was like, oh, I did, I did. I held that information back. And that's something that we do and we internalize this. And out, you know, I, I am out and proud, but at the end of the day, I'm still afraid of what people are going to think about me and what are, how am I going to be judged and what's going to happen. Um, and so that leads to a lot of our issues, you know, internalizing all that hatred and, you know, maybe utilizing less than ideal coping mechanisms to deal with that. You know, that we have really high rates of alcohol, drug and alcohol, um, tobacco use. And so all of those things are really important to create a whole person health, which is really our goal. Thank you so much. I find it incredibly striking how our panelists of clinicians and, and caregivers are also patients themselves and struggle with the exact same thing that all of our patients struggle with. So it's really, I mean, we're all a community and we're all on both sides of uh, the table at times. So this has been really instructive so far. Thank you guys. Um, I only have about two questions left and then I'm going to open it up to everybody else. Um, but this question is for Dr. Geis and Dr. Knox. So LGBTQ patients may have unique needs. I think this came up from somebody over here earlier today um, in regards to seeking reproductive services. So can you both talk about these specific needs uh, and how we can provide really patient-centered, inclusive care at these appointments? Do you want to start? Sure. <laughs> Before I do, I want to say something about sexual assault, because I think um, of all the disclosures that patients have to make, there's probably the largest barrier to disclosing sexual assault. And yet it is probably the common thread between LGBTQ, straight, whatever, it's happened to so many. 
And that's something we really need to think about. I haven't found the solution for how to make somebody comfortable in that disclosure, but at any rate, just wanted to. Yeah, it wasn't, this was her fourth or fifth interaction yeah. before she disclosed. And I think it really was all of those other interactions being, um, being good interactions, mm -hmm. being where she felt safe that led to that place of trust where she could disclose. Well, and the important element there was that you knew, you didn't know what it was, but you knew something. And I get that feeling sometimes, and I often wonder how to get to that issue of sexual assault because it is so well buried. So that's very true. Yeah. She said they might not even remember, and that's very true. So, but on to reproductive <laughs> stuff. You know, there are so many different needs depending on the identity of the patient that you're dealing with. And, um, Let's just take one of the easy ones, which are many of my lesbian patients who come who want to reproduce. If they have all everything in working order, it's a matter of finding sperm. They have eggs. So then we have to offer them an array of donors. And this means really, you know, being thoughtful about how you recommend that people find a donor. I can remember early in practice, I had a lot of patients who would come in with friends. It never ended well. And I, I've come to the place where I have occasional patients who've really done the work with a good friend who wants to be a donor. But most of the time, I try to steer people in the direction of anonymous donors or people who can reveal later on. Um, and that's a really complicated issue and probably a hot button for a lot of people because a lot of people want to have a father that they know. It takes a lot of work to do that. And we probably won't spend all the time here that it takes to talk about all the things that have to be done. And I'm not talking legal work either because I don't think legality is what it comes down to. It's emotion. It's the families around. It's what the barriers are to acceptance of those kids by the families, not just by the two people having them. Um, I use a lot of referrals in that case. I try to encourage my patients to see a therapist and talk about, really talk about what their needs are for the other parent, the other biologic parent, and how they want that person to be involved with the family going forward, if they do at all, and to explore the reasons behind that. And I would say it's probably very different for many people. Um, the more interesting, and I think, um, growing need is how to deal with transgender patients, both F to M and M to F, in terms of parenting. So I've come to a place now where I always ask, do you want to be a parent? And especially if they're confronting wanting gender um, confirming surgery, then if it's a woman you know, transing to a man, then we have to talk about egg freezing, how expensive that is, can you afford to do that? If it's F to M, do you want to spare your uterus? Do you want to carry a child? And if you do, where do you want that child to come from? I've actually identified two reproductive endocrinology practices in the city now that are donating embryo, which I find to be really amazing. So these are embryo that have come from parents who've had all the children they wanted and have completely signed away the rights to these embryo. No adoption is necessary. There's no legal paperwork that needs to be done. This has been tested in the court. It's, it's true. It works. And it's relatively inexpensive. They charge $5,000 to implant an embryo. So there are a lot of new options coming up out there. I think one of the key things for me in my practice has been to find appropriate referrals who are comfortable seeing the patients that I send them because I don't do reproductive endocrinology. So it's very important that I have people that I can call on who I know are not going to be judgmental. They're not going to close their eyes to, to what all of these patients want. I could go on about this all day, but stop it. I would echo everything you said. I think... Um... You know, a few other things that I would bring up that we kind of encounter, um, and I'm just trying to think of some examples. I think one in counseling a same-sex couple um, in trying to decide who's going to carry the pregnancy, I think there are some ramifications there as well. So we'd like to, to discuss that. I, we 
recently actually saw a situation in which the patient who was carrying the pregnancy had some complications and there actually developed some resentment with the partner in that she was able to be out and functioning in normal life while the patient was stuck in bed and having complications. And so there was almost a sort of resentment we don't always see or rarely see in a heterosexual couple because there's not that expectation of you could be doing this too type of a thing. So, so there are a lot of kind of mental facets, emotional facets that go into it. I've also seen kind of a different element of education. Um, you know, some of my patients who have come in who have never been in a heterosexual relationship will come in and volunteer. I've never had to think about this. And suddenly I'm thinking about pregnancy and it's the last thing in my mind. I don't know when I can get pregnant. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So there can be a lot of just kind of simple educational factors that some women aren't willing to or wanting to open up to because it seems like I should know this stuff, but I don't. And so it really is just kind of a, a nice chance to sit down and say, look, we don't do a good job teaching this stuff in our health classes as providers, whatever, and really go through those educational processes. I had one patient recently who just recently became sexually active. Um, she's now identifying as bisexual. So recently became sexually active with a male, had a condom complication, and didn't know where to go with that. This was new to her. So there are a lot of kind of issues that do develop and that kind of might seem like a curveball, but that do come up as we're dealing with reproductive issues that, again, really takes that confidence in being able to sit down and openly talk about what's going on. I think the, the converse, if I could just throw it in, is also the special needs for um, patients who choose not to have pregnancy and the increased risk for things like breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, and making sure that we're also addressing those appropriately with patients so we're not missing that element of pretty critical help. So for my last question, um, you know, we've kind of talked about uh, LGBTQ care from a patient and a practitioner perspective. So I'd like to talk now about the quality improvement and policy side of the equation. I know we spent a lot of time on policy, but uh, Dr. Soto, can you discuss uh, the quality measures that you've enacted at Kaiser Permanente and your... Uh... Absolutely. Um, the first thing that I want to say about that is in my humble opinion, the best way to go about understanding what a patient needs is to ask the patient um, and going from there. And so we're blessed in that we have an LGBTQIA quality improvement committee and um, we have patients come and serve on that committee when they have time. Uh, we do patient panels and questioning and also we have a member services complaint center where if somebody identifies as that and had an issue it comes to us so that we can address it these are some of the things that we've done um, we've worked really hard at the medical chart to include the preferred name pronouns um, health data we're still working on that uh, for the organ inventory uh, things like that but we're certainly working on improving the health medical record so that we can address patients correctly. Um, we are now excited in that we have in-house gender affirming surgery and that program is going very, very well. Uh, and I'm lucky in that I get to see a lot of the patients afterwards. And it used to go, um, a lot used to go to either Arizona or also Northern Cali, but now we're doing it down here at West LA. And it's pretty exciting to be a part of that. Um, the, something that I really work on and I think continually is being done, and this was brought up at the, the last panel for the transgender health, is um, training staff because there's a lot of turnover in, in environmental services, in all kinds of staff. There's a lot of turnover. And um, what we want to do is have our finger on the pulse. So if I hear of something... So we'll do trainings for the mental health department. We'll do trainings for the hospital staff. Uh, I'm blessed in that they'll let me do impromptu trainings in the medical office building where I work. Um, because what I'm finding is that many people are not necessarily wanting to traumatize or injure the patient in front of them. 
I think what happens is that we just don't know and we're afraid of what we don't know. And I think that's true in all of life. We're really afraid of the unknown. And what I find is that when I come to a place with the staff or anybody and I work on, let's talk about how we can talk about this differently, I'm mostly well received from that. And I'm also really working on if somebody has <clears throat> it's crazy stuff, like I'll be in my clinic where I see people living with HIV and I'll have a Latino male, Spanish speaking, and I'm fascinated with how they're speaking ill about Miss Universe from Spain, who was a transgender woman, y eso es de la mujer, and that should just be for the women. And so what I really find is that when we're cruel to somebody else, it's really about our internalized hatred. And so what I really want to do is come at them with an assumption of, okay, maybe I can help you understand something, but if I come at you in a very negative way and I start judging you the way you're judging somebody else, no different. So maybe I can educate somebody with compassionate terms and coming from a place of how can I understand you better so that then I can better help you help the person in front of you. Those are some of the things that, um, that we're doing. We're working with the pediatric department also, you know, because we're wanting to help the LGBTQIA um, pediatric population and learning new terms of, you know, how did you form your family? Is this your parent? Is this your spouse? Rather than mother, father, uh, who are your parents? How did you come to form your family? Rather than the gender normative terms. Those are some of the things we're doing. Thank you. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to our audience to ask our panel questions. If you can please state your name as well as organization uh, when you ask your question. I see one right here. Hi, everyone. My name is Markeisha Henderson. I'm with the Department of Public Health for LA County. Um, so I kind of want to go back to the question where we talked about, um, um, I guess, specifically saying what would be some practices that the organizations represented or suggested practices for addressing the concerns of um, communities when there's not language is not a barrier. So specifically black, the black community. So, I mean, data shows that there are major health implica implications for um, Black people who don't identify as LGBTQ. And so um, what are ways that um, these larger, um, well, when they interface healthcare systems, so what are specific strategies and ways that your organizations are um, addressing or trying to um, work better with the Black community? Because even in this space, um, I don't see many representations or, you know, to my eyes of a person who may identify as black being represented and talking about these issues. And so kind of getting more to that nuance of race in these conversations. Start. I'll start. Um, so you said something interesting where language is not a barrier. And I offer to you the humble um, notion that language is a barrier because we all speak a different language, I think. And my thought process is that I want to understand the specific terms used by everybody and because each individual is a specific we're we're all part of the same organism in my humble opinion but I think we're part very distinct parts of it and so when I meet up with a patient instead of so I do ask how somebody identifies but I first ask about behavior because I think we need to decouple identification with behavior um, and what I specifically mean by that is, of course, the usual question of, do you have sex with men, women, both trans, intersex? Who, with whom do you enjoy sexual pleasure? And then after that, I start asking, how do you identify? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I will clarify as to the reason why I need to know some of these things is so that then I can offer the best education that I know possible in order to keep this person as safe as possible. But really, I think the number one thing that we can do in all organizations is to assume that I don't know exactly the language of that person, but come to them with an open heart and express to them, how can I get to know you better? And what are you here 
and what are you here to tell me so that I can best help you? So it really comes back to I'm working on my own assumptions so that I can best provide care. The, that's one of the things that I talk about, and I think change starts with us. And so that's some of the things that I also work with, teaching the residents, the medical students, staff, and things like that. So I understand the personal relationship. Thank you. Um, or identifying and looking to understand a person off of their personal experiences. But I mean more in the larger sense of policies or strategies that better target um, other cultural groups. And so being in public health, we, we can't check off like, okay, language is one way to identify one group. And so for um, the Black community, yes, there's nuanced language and terminologies that we might have that are different, but I was speaking more so to like larger strategies that better target and address the needs of that group, um, including what you're saying, learning the different terminology and how that person or, you know, people would like to identify. So I just want to clarify that in the language aspect. Thank you. Um, so I'll do one from our audience. Um, we have a parent of a child who identifies as gay and it has been very, I sort of say here, traumatizing to hear all of the discrimination. Um, and they were really wondering, uh, you know, how healthcare providers really, you know, kind of deal with their own personal beliefs. And maybe they've experienced a lot of healthcare providers that the normal and abnormal and that somehow identifying as lesbian or gay or bisexual is abnormal and then heteronormative is normal. And how, how does that play out in the clinic? Um, I think is the question. Please cl clarify if I got anything wrong. Oh. It's a tough question, yeah. I mean, if I could just throw out a couple of comments. I think really it comes down to finding the provider that matches well with you or in that case with your child. I think it's hard to speak on behalf of all the providers out there because we are all completely different. And everybody is going to have their different their different kind of norms and abnormal kind of interpretations of things. And so I think it really is an important thing to find somebody who works with you. I think you know, a lot of people kind of have a notion that in the whole medical world, you're kind of stuck with somebody. And don't ever be afraid to go to a different provider. Don't ever be afraid that if that person doesn't match you and your needs, find someone else. There are a lot of other people out there, and there will be somebody who will work with you, for you, the way you want. And I know it, it's unfortunate. I would love to say everybody is ideal and kind of has the same belief system, but I think it would be probably problematic in that sense, too. So that would be kind of my opinion, is really find the person that will best match your needs. Dr. Soto, maybe you could just comment even, um, since you work with residents and trainees a lot, how we're teaching the next generation of physicians to and to other care practitioners um, to really sort of have a non-formed opinion, you know, you know, before they even meet a patient. Right, so that's a really good question. And it, it really comes to time we spend with those that we're trying to teach. But what's beautiful is I learn from them just as much as they learn from me. Because what's beautiful, I think, about the next generations uh, is that I find that a lot of people in the younger generations are much more open and much more interested. And I find that they're very, very interested in learning about how to approach certain things. Um, and it's much more normalized for them but I will say one of the things that I really work on very much in this arena is I think in order to really serve a patient well, I really think it starts with how we treat ourselves. And I have been done, done a lot reading on the subject and things like that. And much of society, and I think in medical settings where we've had to work our ass off to get to where we are, 
um, I don't think we're very kind to ourselves. And I don't think most of the patients I ask are not very kind to themselves. And so what I'm trying to teach those coming after me is that if we really want to be the best provider we can be, it really starts with how we talk to ourselves. Because if we talk to ourselves in a much more compassionate way, we are generally likely going to be kinder to our patients. Because if it slips out sideways, that's sometimes internalized racism, internalized sexism, internalized, you know, and something that there's a lot of ways to be discriminated in this world. And I happen to have some of those. I happen to have obesity for a reason that I'm struggling with, but I do I have internalized sizeism, right? And so the way I talk to myself is something that I'm really teaching because if we talk to ourselves in a kinder, more compassionate way, that's one of the ways in which we can really provide the best care to somebody else. That's where it starts. Um, so can we talk about what type of research or follow-up is being done to see outcomes after gender-confirming surgery? Are there any longitudinal studies being done to follow mental or physical health outcomes? Um, I'll comment on that at first to say that I don't know of any um, studies like that, but I think there is an increasing level of awareness, at least in the GYN community, that we need to have more information. I mean, I know that every day when I confront somebody who's transitioning and they ask me what their blood level of testosterone should be, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we treat to effect. But where it really comes into play is there's now a conversation in the GYN community about when we do hysterectomies on trans men, we always remove the ovaries. And we remove the ovaries because it makes their testosterone work better. Um, most of them feel a little emotionally more comfortable, but the literature on women shows that we shorten their lives. What do you do with that? And is that true in a trans man who's on testosterone? I don't know. But I'm having to start to, I'm, I'm having that conversation now with my trans patients who are looking at hysterectomy, ophorectomy, and some of them are opting to keep their ovaries. But we need proof. So I'm down with that question. We need more information. And the same with mammograms in, uh, in trans men. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. More research needs to be done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I have a kind of specific question, um, but can a woman who is HIV positive donate her embryos? But why? Don't know. There's no evidence that, you know, a woman is born with every egg she ever has. So those eggs are not HIV infected. I think it's the concern about the process of retrieval that is an issue. And the attitude is better safe than sorry. I'm not sure I agree with it. Hi, uh, I'm Lindsay Lawrence from Keck Medicine of USC. My question is more kind of on the back end, and especially with the GYN practitioners dealing with insurance companies, and especially if a patient is not, you know, legally one, you know, that if there's something different with their insurance and they don't want to necessarily be out to their insurance provider or even to their workplace or however they're getting their insurance. How are you navigating that and do you have any like systems in place that formalize a process? Wow. Well, it got a lot easier a couple of years ago when both the Blues came out with a policy that they would approve any medical procedure that was appropriate to the cis identity of the patient, which opened the door for us to say, for example, with trans men that they had pelvic pain or they had reasons why. And I don't do phalloplasties, I don't do top surgery, but I do hysterectomies. So all of a sudden, here was an avenue to insurance collection. The problem we've run into is that many trans men have changed their 
um, birth certificates, driver's licenses, and insurance to be insured as males. So then we would get challenged because they were insured as males. But I'm like, well, yes, but genetically they're females, and on and on it goes. And then we get to we get insurance approval now. I've I've had five in a row cases now where we got insurance approval, and then the hospital had a hissy fit because I was sterilizing a genetic female under the age of 30. So I had to talk with the spiritual counselor in Minnesota about about that. Twice I won, three times I lost. These barriers, hopefully, the insurance one has been huge. That approval for us to be able to do these procedures has been major. And I've had a rush of patients coming in to, to get it. Obviously, we still have to go through the hoops. And it takes a lot of phone calls and a lot of letter writing, and you have to just be persistent. But in the end, we usually win. So is that your experience? or? Well, I, I'm a little bit... I probably have an easier answer in the sense that Kaiser, working for Kaiser, I'm yes. covered by one insurance plan or organization, and they do approve of trans surgery. The one issue we do frequently run into, and especially if perhaps I think you said is they didn't want to be out to their insurance, that's not so much what we run into as they don't want to notify their employer. So often the patient has their insurance through the employer. And they don't want to go to the employer to say, I am now identifying myself as male or as female. I need to change my gender and my name on the insurance plan. And that's where then there becomes more of kind of a complicating factor. So they can change everything outside of that, but often it's, it's more at the employer level than at the insurance level. And that one is a struggle because that then is kind of outside our realm and, and goes out of our hands a little bit. And I don't know the best answer for that, unfortunately. So I have one, one more thing, just a, like a practical tip, if it's that you're having trouble getting a mammogram or a pap smear covered, there's a modifier code, um, Q45, that you can add, and then they'll cover it. Or, or, or trans. Or, well, yes, for, for if, you're, if you're ordering like a mammogram for someone who was assigned male at birth and their insurance card says male, um, that would, get, that would get it covered if that's the issue that you're coming into. Oh. Amazing. Thank you. Learn something every day. I have uh, one comment, and then I think I see a question over here. So a uh, comment from our audience. If your child or family member is LGBTQ, give support, please. You may be the only person that can help them not commit suicide because they feel alone and not accepted. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm not sure if this is exactly the right panel. I work with a homeless population, um, and obviously the connection between housing and health is strong, right? We uh, have a lot of clients who prefer to get their mental health services at places like St. John's if they're trans or to get a lesbian center if they're trans or LGBT, as opposed to going through DMH, no offense to anybody here. Um, but that excludes them from access to housing through DM through mental health um, uh, funding streams. Would you recommend to a client to go to sort of a generic mental health provider or to go to a specialized provider in a situation in which they might have access to housing if they went with the other one? I. I I'm sorry, but I feel they always need, I don't think the run-of-the-mill mental health provider may be up to it. But what you're saying is if they, if they go there, they have better access to housing, is that? Uh-huh. To provide housing for people, uh -huh. they have to be going to a DMH provider. A lot of the well, then go and satisfy the requirement, but then go to a real, <laughs> a real therapist somewhere else. That's that's what I would do. That's what we tell them. Yeah. Wonder could they could they do both? Is that an option? Um, it. I mean, I think it depends on Medi-Cal and what they're willing to do, or it, you know, if if they have HAPWA or what you know what sort of what's going on with them individually. But a lot of places you're not allowed to double dip. 
So I can say at the center, and I'm not part yeah. of the social services team, but I know we work a lot with housing. We get a lot of people housed. We get a lot of people. We've got some of my clients housed. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. We work really hard. We have a, a huge department that's doing that. Um, we also, importantly, through that, um, that Prop H money, are able to keep people housed. So what we find is that people are already sort of marginally housed and then just one thing happens, one illness, one crisis, and they can't pay rent that month and then they're homeless. So we've been able to keep people housed, which I think is something that's really, really important. And we're about to get a lot more housing, so. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah. we are. Yeah. <laughs> Any last questions? Hello. Um, I was trying to think about how to formulate this to a question, or maybe you can just you know rattle it off and see how it comes out. So, um, my colleague Sylvia, she asked this question earlier, and so I feel like this is more like the panel to because it's been coming up a little bit more. My name is Gabby Juarez. I'm a district public health nurse uh, for the county, and I work out of the uh, North Hollywood area. And so I don't know if everybody knows how, like, let's say, a position like mine would work, but if you go to your provider, regardless of your identity, any anything, but if you get diagnosed with a communicable disease and you live in, let's say, the area that I cover, I'm going to be calling you. And so when the referrals come through, say, for a positive STD, right now in the district, um, the work's sort of divided because we can't, you know, possibly follow every patient. Um, so we, we cover, say, women of child-rearing age with uh, STDs specifically. And then the program deals with other populations that fall into a positive STD. Okay. So we get referrals, and more and more, uh, let's say I get a referral, and we often stick our proverbial foot in our mouths because the referrals say female, the labs say female, Everything says female. We call the clinics. They verify, but there's no LMP. I don't know why there's none, but, you know, and so when we call the patient, it turns out that they're not of, you know, they don't fall into the category of which we were assigned. It's not our fault. It's a mishap, and we try to, I guess, handle it as gently as possible, but I'm finding that that information, as I'm following the paper trail, when it got referred, who put the information in, when it was coming through, that information was never shared. And I feel like it's coming more and more important, obviously not as a bias, just as medical providers, you know? Like what's a, a normal H and H for someone who's, you know, trans man, trans woman. And so it's like in the in the endeavor to try to make everybody feel inclusive and respect their uh, the rate at which someone wants to disclose, there's also the other side where it's important to know you know, biologically sometimes in order to be able to do our work, I think, well. And right now it's just coming off as like offending. You know, it's like and everybody's very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hot button issue. So emotions run high. So, again, I don't know what the really question is. I just want to make sure it's providers that we're all aware that when there's a referral that goes out and we get it, we have no idea what we're dealing with. And so now we have to put that person through the trauma again and through the questioning um, and oftentimes they don't even know that there's, like anybody who lives in LA County, wherever your address is, you have a public health nurse that's watching out for you. And you have no idea, you know? So we are sort of back there going, you know, trying to do our best, but we also need everybody sort of to communicate that, you know, if you think you're gonna refer somebody for an acute communicable disease, someone's going to be calling them and it's not about gender and it's not about sexual orientation or it's literally about this positive result and then as we dig we might ask we ask very personal questions if they have shigella we, we're asking them about their sexual practices so all of that i don't know if maybe it's just a you know just another way for us to i guess better serve you know everybody but in doing so i feel like we're still you know, we're causing more uh, damage, you know. And so as, yeah, we just have to find better ways. I, I will say at least at UCLA, um, maybe over the last 
year or two, I'm not sure exactly when it went in place, but we have a sexual identity and um, gender form that's actually part of our electronic medical record. It's in the same section as your past medical history, your social history, do you smoke, do you drink alcohol, what is your gender identification, which organs do you have, what pronouns do you prefer, and that is part of a very visible place. The problem is the implementation, as we were talking about in one of our earlier breakout sessions, is how many practitioners are using this, how many of our ancillary staff know to look here, but I think that the hope is over time, we can move towards normalizing that questionnaire, doing it more commonly, and then having it be a reference so that that does not happen over and over again. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Did our panel have anything to say to that at all? Dr. Pregler. I just comment, I think one of that, that may be a feedback actually for DPH because again, when we send those forms in, it's the government, it's a form. So it may be the form needs to be different to the extent that patients would feel comfortable with us disclosing on the form. Um, the second thing I'd say again, it, it is, as, an, as a provider, you have to become educated about this. To your point, um, you know, I've diagnosed things in, you know, elderly heterosexual couples and I've said, you know, you're gonna get a call and they're going to ask you a lot of questions. And I find that when, you know, anybody is sort of pre-warned about this, then they may feel better about it if it comes from their practitioner why, you know, these questions are coming. So I agree with you. I think it's a lot of education of, of, of this process. How are we doing on time? Any more questions at all? Anna? I want to thank everybody so much for your participation and really for our panelists. This was amazing. Was there one more question? Hold on. Yes. I just wanted to piggyback on the question about um, how um, healthcare providers um, can implement policies that are more inclusive of a black community or community of colors, um, if I could um, get answers to that. So uh, I think that we must first acknowledge that we don't always do the greatest job of capturing certain communities. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge that. And so there are things that we can do with awareness of that, is being aware of that and having offices in certain communities and things like that. And I, we look at this not just in the LGBTQIA community, but also looking at hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, uh, there are certain cultures that are highly represented in those categories that are not represented in the general population. And so being aware of that is something that we have been thinking about at Kaiser a lot. And so some of the things that has been brought up last week is going to local churches, um, community centers where we might go to the community rather than expecting them to come to us. Those are some of the things that has been brought up lately. But yes, you're right. We have some work to do with that. Uh, you want it just kind of bringing up a different hat that I wear. I do sit on um, some quality improvement aspects within Kaiser again. Um, but so I do, I am actually privy to a lot of the information about different aspects like you're talking about, like glycemic control in the Hispanic population or blood pressure control in the African-American population and different measures that people are really actually taking a lot of interest in and a lot of efforts toward. And it's not just a Kaiser Permanente thing. This data is statewide, it's nationwide, it's organization to organization. And so there really are a lot of kind of 
behind the scene efforts toward those different health disparities among different different groups, whether that's ethnicity, whether that's whatever it might be. So there is a lot behind that. I think a big part of it is education. Unfortunately, I just think a huge part of education is going to be this rolling ball that needs to better reach everybody. But those efforts are there and the attention is there and it is truly a national motivation or incentive to address all of those healthcare needs. So I don't know if that helps, but I do know that those programs are there and are being very closely looked at. And hopefully we're seeing some improvement for the better. Like one of the places that we really are failing is capturing um, men who ha- identify as men who having sex with men and pre-exposure prophylaxis. We're not doing a good job about that in this country. And so we are doing studies in order to see how we can better do that. Um, because there are certain pockets of the population that we are just missing. And so we're looking at it and looking at how we can best serve that particular population. This is all a pretty good argument for a universal health care system, because then we would have access to everybody's information in one place and we would learn a great deal. So a little political jibe there. Do you have a question? I would like to know what you think we can do better to um, engage. um. So that is an amazing question. And I I would actually encourage you all to network afterwards and really have that discussion. And also look inside your packet, because that gives you a lot of information on how to reach out to these organizations. Um, So I hate to wrap up our amazing discussion. Um, I would just say if the panel has, you know, one or two last things to say of just an action step forward, um, or if not, uh, we thank you so much for today. This was really wonderful. So I don't know if anybody got the chance to visit our tables out there, but we have something called the Resistance Squad um, at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. BT Center, and right now we're working on a legislative, legislative, I cannot talk, sorry, legislative budget ask, and we're actually, we stopped using the word ask, and we're saying it's a demand for $18 million to create the Lesbian, Bisexual, Queer Women's Health Equity Fund. There are no state funds ever have been um relegated to our community to study our community. It would be uh, a grant system. So all of you in this room could apply for this money and make a change, make um, a big change. So uh, right now, if you're, if you can pull out your phones, I have an email address. It's lalgbtcenter.org backslash help queer women. And there you'll find links to actionable things that you can do. At our table, we have these postcards that say we're counting on you because we're counting on the community for support. Um, And you can address these postcards to your legislator or to the budget um, committee. I was just in Sacramento giving testimony to the committee. And I have to say, it was really, I was shocked at how shocked they were that they had, it really felt like they weren't aware of all these disparities and that we are such an invisible population. So it's really important um, that we do this. It, um, you can sign up for our letter writing, our campaigning, our phone banking, or you can just write a postcard. Anything that you, you can do would help. Thank you so much.